<clears throat> All right, we are live. This is paraglidingtalk.com. I'm your host, Robert Michaels. So glad that you're here tonight to talk about paragliding with us. I'm pretty excited about our guest. Our guest tonight is Eddie. Eddie, uh, we also call him Shreddy. Uh, Shreddy Eddie is a local here. He's a pilot of paragliding, paramotoring, and uh, also a private pilot um, for uh, a fixed wing aircraft. Uh, I don't know how to say it, but private, he can take you on in an airplane. And so uh, we're going to have some great stuff on this show, this episode. Um, we're going to ask him some questions about uh, uh, aviation in general, and then we're going to see if we can squeeze out some stuff that we can learn in this episode. I do want to encourage everyone to go check out paraglidingtalk.com for the shows that are coming up. Uh, next week's show is going to be with uh, Resurgence PPG, uh, the founder. Uh, his name is Todd. Uh, Todd's going to come and join us. He is, uh, uh, he's got a great organization that supports military guys who have been injured. Um, and um, he gets them up in the air, also helping guys with um, PTSD. And he has just a great organization. He uh, was also in the Army. So that show is going to be a great time. Uh, I do want to encourage you to come and join us for that live if you can. Uh, I just noticed Sean in the uh, chat. Sean, I sent you an invite so you can come and moderate if you'd like. Uh, go check your email. And um, we have another show coming up after that. Uh, that following week is going to be an episode on speed flying. So we're going to talk all about speed flying. We're going to have a couple of the big dogs here at uh, Saboba. They're going to be on here with us, a guy named David and a guy named Rich. And I'm going to try to invite uh, the famous Jessica Frump. We're going to try to have her come back on again. That was a great show. And so anyways... Just wanted to give you guys a heads up with what's, what was going on with the uh, the next shows. You're joined tonight uh, with Max Martini and Pair Perspective. Uh, Neil is uh, moderating the show. Uh, he's a paramotor pilot as well. And uh, if you don't know Max Martini, go check out his channel. He is an acro aficionado. And uh, I don't know if I said that right. Fishin How do you say it? Aficionado? He's a professional. <laughs> and he's an instructor. And so he has a school there in Brazil, and uh, he also has a Patreon. I encourage you guys to go sign up for his Patreon. I learned so much stuff from him. I decided to uh, throw him a couple bucks for his videos and his shows, and so go check that out. And uh, Max Martini, he's a local hero here uh, on the show. We were saying earlier that he was one of the first guys on the show. But anyways, without further delay, uh I'm stoked about having Shreddy Eddie on the show. We we tried to nail him down a couple weeks ago. He's a he's a busy guy, and so uh, we nailed him down. He's literally at the zoo right now, at the San Diego Zoo, and uh, his family is going through the zoo as we speak. He broke away to come get on his phone and use his app so he can join us tonight. And I wish I had like the applaud button and the <laughs> cheering. <laughs> So we can. So uh, let's ask the first simple question: How did you end up getting into the sport? And uh, tell us a little bit about your entry. Well, kind of just like anyone else. I mean, we're all kids. We all see our first airplane fly across, uh, you know, the sky, and we always dream of flying. So the way I got into paragliding is basically um, the same way as anyone else. You know, you want to fly. You want to be experienced what flight is like. Uh, I think I was about 18 years old at the time, when I, or 19, 19 years old when I first started. And uh, it was basically the cheapest or least expensive way, I should say, for me to experience flight. Um, I went out and uh, I found uh, an Epsilon 3 way back in the day, and I got a brand new glider I just bought from some guy randomly in Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, that was my first entry into paragliding is basically I just wanted to fly. And I didn't care if I got four feet off the ground down. To me, it was an amazing experience just to be able to like fly. It was it was it was unreal. So that's that's basically why I, I started paragliding. Uh, just like anyone else, it's it's the freedom of flight. And once you experience flight with with silence around you, especially with paragliding, because it is such a you're so connected to nature and you're so connected to to uh, all the elements around you. There's no motors. There's it's just silent. 
So, so you're basic at nature's mercy. So it, it was even more of a great experience because of the, because of the, the the platform that that we all all in right now was paragliding. Did you um? Did you say you just went out and bought a wing? Yep. Isn't that, that against the rules? Uh, well, back then I don't think there was much rules, but uh, the FAA didn't really care much, and uh, we're not breaking any laws. Okay, so tell us about that, because that's that's exactly what I did, but it's not a good idea, and I'll, I'll elaborate. Not. And, but, and 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 I, 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 I before I continue, I want to discourage anyone from doing what I did. Uh, it okay. was it was very stupid. Um, it uh, it did end up with one hospital trip for me and my brother. Um, but other than that, I think we walked away very lucky that we didn't get killed when we first started flying. Um, we actually taught ourselves to fly. Okay, uh, so which I, I once again will never encourage anyone to do it. <laughs> it's what we we almost killed ourselves a few times, and, and we can get into that later. But so it that's is a very very dangerous sport. That's the political correct answer. But you of shared course. with me the real deal. These guys went out to a local hill. And one of the first couple times, um, did you guys even practice kiting very much before? Well, yeah. And, and, and to, to guide, digress a little bit, um, when I did pick up my wing in Santa Barbara, we did go out with someone that uh, was a paraglider. And, you know, we went to a little training hill and we kited wow. a little bit and on the hill. I mean, as it's, it's crazy as I am, I'm not stupid. Right. Um, Dumb. But uh, we did play around a little bit on training hill. I had a lot of experience with remote control aircraft before that. So I flew anywhere from powered aircraft. I was an instructor for for uh, for RC as a kid. I, I built a, I learned, I understood a lot about airfoils. I, I knew how to fly gliders. I understood how air currents work, lift, thermals, lee side, uh, all that stuff I already knew. So just for the audience, I, I, I knew where not to fly. Let's put it that way. I didn't go jump off of the lee side of an eye, a, a hill and go, why the hell did I just die? Um, <laughs> but my brother and I were both kind of in it together. We, uh, we, we did practice kiting quite a bit. Uh, we did a lot of ground handling before we actually took off. Um, but we would push each other down. We went into a, a place that, were de that was developing a bunch of homes that went bankrupt. So they had staggered hills kind of going down. And we would push ourselves down these little embankments and I think the total vertical altitude of descent was maybe, you know, 70, 80 feet. So we tried that for like a week and kind of played around with it. Um, but the first real flight we experienced was off of the, like a 400 foot hill. And literally my brother and I stood on top of this thing. We flipped the coin and said, who's going to go first? Um, me being the owner of the paraglider uh, was, uh, I was going to say, no, it's me. So I, I basically launched off the, the, the hill I flew around. I ended up crashing into the side of the hill. Uh, once again, this is why you do not learn like I did. Um, I happened to, to come. I was I was I was doing outside turns uh, on a ridge, and uh, I miscalculated one of my turns, and I ended up impacting the side of the hill. Um, I've never seen my brother sprint down a mountain so fast. He looked like a gazelle. I remember looking up and seeing this guy jumping through the bushes, and he thought I was dead. So uh, once again, to the audience, stupid, 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 uh, all over it. Uh, he came down. We picked the glider out of the bushes. If anyone's flown Southern California, this is not a place you want to put a glider into the bushes. It takes forever to get them out. Um, our bushes here are rough, thorny, and, and very dry. So uh, an hour and a half later, after we picked everything up and uh, took it to the top of the hill, my brother said, my turn. And uh, he decided to fly. Uh, but instead of turning, he decided to go straight off the mountain and uh, land safely at the parking lot down below. So uh, luckily that was uneventful, but once again, warning, that was dumb as all could be. Uh, we could have both ended up either killed or, or, or severely permanently injured that day, so. How long ago <laughs> did that happen? Oh gosh, uh, 18, 19 years ago, a long time ago. Oh wow. So, so once again, I, I, I- Actually a, a, a dino from from the pre-flight scene, aren't you? I guess so. I mean, I, I didn't have any money to get certified back in those days. Uh, I barely could afford my glider. Um, so I didn't really have a chance to, to pay an instructor properly. And when you're broke and you're a teenager, uh, safety is not the, the first thing that comes to your mind. So <laughs> you just want to fly and you're so excited that you're like, let's go do it, even if it's stupid. 
what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, you could kill yourself. And that's, that's the bottom line. So, uh, I highly advise against that, that tactic. Um, but, uh, it is something that, that it's a true story. This is what happened. It's how me and my brother learned. Um, we flew for about a year during that time until we wrecked my, uh, my glider so bad that it was beyond repair. We still have it and hangs in his, in his spare bedroom as, as a shrine. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, we actually have had formal training since then. And I have actually gone through all the ranks and, uh, now I got my tandem rating. So, uh, once again, I, I, even after flying for so long without ratings in the very beginning, it was very nice to actually take, uh, a, a class and learn about paragliding from people that understand it. Because, uh, one of the scariest things about learning on my own and flying on my own with zero input from any other pilots besides me and my brother just trying this out was we didn't know the limitations of the actual aircraft that we're flying. So when I, when I was flying, I was mostly nervous. Um, I didn't know what was good, what was bad. When I took a slight deflation or, uh, or an asymmetric, I had no idea what those things were and I would avoid them so badly because I thought that that was the end of the world. Uh, now I could pull on my A's and I have no problems with it because I've gotten SIVs and everything else. But learning the way I did, I think, was almost counter counterproductive because it scared the, the, the living daylights out of me to the point that I wasn't ever comfortable flying in my early days until I received proper training um, just because I didn't know the limitations of the aircraft. So let's uh, segue into this. You're an actual private pilot. And... Um what have you transferred out of uh, private piloting to paragliding? Well, um, paragliding and, and, and private pilot, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of differences there. Um, paragliding, we learn a little about, the, we, we learn something about the weather, a little bit about the airspace, but most of it's about, you know, how to handle the glider and uh, situational awareness and, and, and how the actual uh, item flies. With, with private piloting, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's more broad. Um, you learn about general aviation quite a bit more. Uh, you learn about uh, uh, weather systems quite a bit more um, and airspace as well because you're constantly uh, dealing with communication with towers and airspaces around you. We as uh, paraglider pilots don't do that very much or, or not at all. Uh, so I think the biggest thing for me learning from, from uh, having my uh, general aviation uh, license to, and transferring into private or uh, paragliding is all the rules and regulations of airspaces and where really not to fly. Um, we do have a lot, of, a lot of people here that fly across country quite a bit. We have a couple shining stars here in San Diego. Um, and I, I've watched and tracked a lot of people flying, uh, even people getting into cross country. And one of the first things I realize is a lot of the mistakes that are being made by even advanced uh, paragliding pilots. Um, they think they know airspaces, um, but they, you know, as long as they look at a map and say, well, I didn't cross in the air in the airspace, I should be fine. In my mind, that's, that's not the correct answer because there's approaches, there's departures, um, there's holding patterns. There's a lot of different things that aircraft for general aviation and commercial aviation abide by that we kind of don't have an idea about as paragliders. Um, just because you're not breaking airspace doesn't mean you're not doing something completely stupid. Um, for instance, there's a lot of VORs, uh, which for the audience, that they don't know what VOR, VORs are. VORs are basically nothing more than um, uh, omnidirectional antennas on the ground that broadcast a signal that airplanes could tune into to fly a specific course and they, could, they use them for navigation purposes. Uh, VORs have been around for a very long time. It's, it's pre-GPS data. So it's what, what uh, aviation used to use. They still use it uh, for approaches and navigating through the air during conditions that they cannot see out the window. Um, it's a navigational aid, uh, and, and those are all over the United States. There's thousands of them, thousands of them located everywhere. So just because you're, you're not breaking airspace, you may be flying um, where there may be traffic. Um, and those, those people that are flying airplanes, nine times out of 10, when they're, you know, precision appro approaches or they're using uh, any kind of these VORs, they're usually not looking out the window, um, especially when they're flying under IFR conditions, which is uh, instrument conditions, which is basically you're, you're on the radio with tower or air traffic control. They're guiding you through the sky on a set pattern of where you're supposed to be flying, um, especially for uh, approaches and landings uh, as a pilot. 
you aren't really paying attention to what's going out on outside the window. Uh, especially for, for commercial pilots. I have a lot of friends that are commercial pilots. The last thing they're doing is looking out the window when they're uh, you know, flying a 70 or two or 300 passenger airplane down to approach and landing. Even though they're, it's clear skies and they can see, they're going through a million uh, 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 documents with checklists. They're, they're going through a, 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 a tremendous amount of data, especially for landing. Um, they may be in holding patterns. They may be diverted because there's oncoming traffic. So there's a lot of variables that come into play for general aviation and commercial aviation that we as paraglider pilots are not aware of. Um, and that becomes uh, uh, a hazard, uh, not just for the paraglider, but for the giant jet. I mean, God forbid someone make a mistake um, and you, you look down at your charts and you see, okay, I'm not in any kind of air restricted airspace, I'm good. And all of a sudden there's a 747 right next to you and you end up as a bug on their windshield. That would be devastating for not just the paragliding community, but aviation in general. I never want to see that happen. Um, so sorry to go off on a tangent here, but a, no. as a pilot, I, I realize there's a lot of, there's a lot of gaps, um, especially with, with paraglider training. I've, I, I've got my, I've gotten all the way up to my T, uh, T3 right now. So I've done quite a bit of training. I, I've done um, uh, SIVs. And the one thing I think was missing from the whole paraglider perspective is proper training. Um, I, I think everyone in the room here will agree with me that instructors, your instruction is only as good as your instructors. And there's not like a real set syllabus for paragliders. Every instructor has its, has its own, his or her, her own way of teaching people. Um, they may not always cover everything which is fine but uh you know there's no like set platform of this is what needs to be taught this is what needs to be understood so you could get your p3 um it's all over the board i mean I, i've heard stories from people going yeah I, how'd you get your p3 they're like well you know i hung out with a guy for a weekend and i bought him a 12 pack of beer and we had a really good time fine <laughs> and you got your p3 yes okay well that's probably you know, just as stupid as me jumping off of a, of a, of a mountain and trying to fly on my own. It, it, it doesn't really prep you for the real world. Um, when I got my pilot's license, it was a set set of standards. It was very difficult. It's probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life when it comes to testing. Um, I, my test to get my private pilot's license, not instrument rating or anything else, but just to get my private pilot's license was a five hour test with an FAA official. Um, I paid the guy 500 bucks. He made 100 bucks an hour, and literally, I think I had to throw away my shirt at the end of the day. It was so soaked. It was <laughs> it was the scariest and hardest thing I ever did. It was two hours or three, two or three hours of ground. So he would literally just throw a bunch of scenarios at me while we're sitting at a at a table. Uh, well, then we got into the cockpit of the airplane once again, grilled me for about an hour, uh, and then we got into the flying part, which was even more grueling because. You know, uh, he's just throwing a million things at you and I'm trying to fly an airplane at the same time. So um, I think the standards of testing and the standards of training between paragliding and, and aviation are very, very different. I can see you, Tony. <laughs> 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 anyway, so uh, I, I think that's the biggest thing coming from general aviation into paragliding is the, the amount of training that we needed to go through there and, and the knowledge that isn't applied in paragliding. Tony's trying to chime in here. I th uh -oh. The I'm trolls. Trying to chime All in. I was trying to say was I could see you too, sweetheart. Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Yes. You just, <laughs> loud and clear. Yeah. The, the trolls Eddie. have found us. Oh boy. Climbed out from under the bridge for this show. So, uh, so sorry to kind of rant on there, Robert, but uh, no, that's I, mean, that's I hope good. that answers your question. No, that's that's exactly what I was interested in. Because it is, you know, we're, we're all flying things. We're all sharing airspace. It's important that we don't um, end up as a, like you said, a, a bug on the windshield of somebody else's plane. I've seen a couple. Uh, Chris Cote was flying one day, and um, I think he was, uh, you know, the the camera didn't do the justice, but it um, it looked like it was about, you know, a couple thousand feet away from him, and um, that's that, close enough, man. That Learjet did not see him. That Lee yeah. Jet probably did not even see him. And it, no as way. I said, he was probably buried in his controls, buried in his checklist, doing his, uh, you know, procedures for landing. Yep. And, and that's, I actually remember uh, that picture. I saw it online and I talked to Chris. I'm like, you know, there are approaches between 
here in San Diego that even though you're not breaking airspace, there are planes and heavy traffic. One thing too about general aviation I'll add is most of the time we are on two-way radio with everybody around us or some sort of governing body like uh, air traffic control. If we do something completely stupid or we're flying into a place and we're on the radio with air traffic control, they will let us know that we're being idiots, basically. Right. Uh, they'll go, hey, look, you're about to fly into a restricted area. Are you aware of that? And you will radio back usually going, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'll just change course. Um, also, they do warn you that there's oncoming traffic or, or we're approaching a place there, there may be an approach. We don't have that as paraglider pilots. And um, personally, I carry two radios with me, uh, especially when I do longer higher flights and I'm, uh, I do have my aviation radio with me. Um, so I can kind of listen in and see what's going on in the air around us. Um, there are people that like to play with airplanes and they're not really confined to, to flying into an airport or now out of an airport. Um, I mean, rat race last year, uh, we had a guy fly uh, an airplane underneath a gaggle of 200 people. He had no idea that we were there, um, but it was, it was a very close call. He was actually underneath us. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, squawk about that one, but Technically, I mean, everyone went crazy about it. Um, they're like, "Get it. We got his tail number. I looked up his aircraft. Um, there's a whole bunch of squawking about, you know, you know, of him breaking rules because there was a, there was a notice to airmen that we're having a, a, a race that weekend. Flying. Right. Exactly. But but technically, he did not break any rules. Everyone thought he brought broke rules, but he didn't. He just wasn't right. looking out his window because who knows what he was go going through. I mean, he did veer his aircraft around quite a bit because he probably looked out his window at one point and saw, you know, two or 300 paragliders up in the air. Uh, and it was, it was, uh, it was pretty congested right. in the air that day. But once again, it goes both ways. Um, if we were all on the same frequency, he probably would have hurt us. But since we're not on the same frequency, um, but those are all politics about, you know, how ham radios work and licenses and everything else. But one of my biggest things is communication. I, I so, carry two radios only so I can listen to what's going on in the air around us. So you um you flew in that. I heard that was a pretty that's that was some pretty gnarly air, even this last one. Um you've flown in that a few times. Maybe talk about how uh, some of your wild flights um and um and what you learned from them. Um in general or at the rat race specifically? No, no, just in general. Oh, gosh, I guess every day is a wild ride. I mean, uh, one of the worst things I ever did, and I mean, I'm going to advise people not to do stupid things again, is uh, this was back in my early days of paragliding, is my brother and I decided it would be a very good idea to do some some towing. Now, we never heard of towing paragliders before. We were stuck on an island in the middle of uh, Baja on the Sierra Cortez, and we were, we were real boy. We decided to get a climbing rope and uh, my paraglider and my jet ski. Um, a really good recipe for the disaster. Um, <laughs> we ended up towing each other up. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. This, actually ended my, th this ended my paragliding career for about 16 years. So this is where I crashed my Epsilon 3 and destroyed it. But uh, basically, uh, my brother was on the paraglider and we took off and uh, we rigged together a climbing rope with a, with a safety release that uh, I could release at any moment if I needed to get away from the situation. Well, since we were next to water and salt water, something bound up and it wasn't really working correctly. And I didn't find that out till I was about 100 feet off the ground. Um, so whatever, what happened is my brother took off the jet ski. I, I lifted off with a paraglider and about, I'd say about 10 seconds into the flight, I got locked out. Now, I didn't know what a lockout was at that point. I was just like, why is my paraglider turning that way when I got full break in this way? And the ground's starting to shoot up at me. So I'm trying to get the carabiner off and, and release myself from the tow rope. Uh, and there was so much tension on the line because I was being locked out that it wouldn't, it, was, it actually bound itself even harder. Um, so what ended up happening is my brother realized what was going on and he let off the throttle on the jet ski, which instantly removed the carabiner and released me from the, the, the tow bridle that we had set up and, and makeshift it together. So if the paraglider's here and I'm here getting towed, the jet ski's this way. And as soon as I released, I swung back around. And once again, no formal training. I, I had no idea what I was doing. And as soon as I swung underneath my canopy and went over the top like a, like, 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 like a wing over, 
um, my canopy deflated and I went falling about a hundred feet into the beach. So, um, yeah, it was pretty nasty. And we were there with a couple of people. They were having their nice little hippies and no offense to hippies. I love them. I was camped with them, but they're having their Zen moment on the other side of the sand dune, which I impacted. Uh, as soon as I hit the ground, my canopy actually opened, probably slowing my descent and saving my life. Um, I remember oh people on God. the other side of the dune saying, oh, my God, he's dead. What do we do? We're out in the middle of Mexico. There's no hospitals. No, I, I left a six foot crater, um, but I was completely unhurt. I was a little shooken up, but I wasn't hurt. Wow. Um, it, ended up def- it ended up blowing out a couple of cells on my paraglider. Uh, and then my brother and I proceeded to try it again, but go straight out into the water next time where <laughs> It didn't, it didn't go so well with a half broken glider and we decided to can the idea. And I think that paraglider sat wet in my bag for about six months until I opened it. And uh, that was the end of my paragliding career. And I started flying a- airplanes until uh, about three years ago when I got back into paragliding again or four years ago now. Oh my word. So that was one of the scariest moments I ever had paragliding. And it, it was so bad that it actually made me quit the sport for a very long time. Did your brother still fly? Absolutely. Uh, he took the same hiatus I did. Um, he actually is the one that got me back into flying as a wedding present. He brought me up to Saboba to go speed flying right after I had back surgery. Nice. <laughs> it wasn't the best experience of my life because speed flying, as anyone knows, you kind of come down a little bit faster than paragliding. So I decided that I wanted to paraglide again. And uh, my instructor at the time had a paraglider and said, let's get you paragliding. And uh, here I am today paragliding again. So that kind of got me back into the sport. My brother's become a really great pilot. He lives in Hawaii. Uh, he's getting into acro. Uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful pilot. He, he flies a lot of different wings. He's got quite a bit of experience in it. Plus, he lives in one of the best places in the world for that type of flying. I mean, you have a ridge that's you know gets you up to 2,500 feet. So you can yeah. just go out, push over the beautiful blue water, and have a great time. It's like Torrey Pines on steroids. Nice. Yeah, I do want to do that trip sometime. Probably Tony Boyer, know. are you still there? You got it on mute, and I don't think you can – you can't figure out how to get it off of mute. Smoke signals, Tony. Come on. I wanted to – I just wanted to mess with him since you mentioned hippies. I was wondering <laughs> I was wondering where those two hippies are going right now. Probably Blossom. I don't know, bro. It's 630. I think they're on a different – It's real north. Here. Yeah, it's real north today, too. I, I sung by Tori, and it was pretty nasty. I know Tony, like, he's he's not working right now, so I think he's going to, like, big boy flying. Maybe he's going to Saboba or Marshall or something. Or a bunny slope to go practice his kiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're over there talking. They ain't even paying attention. Exactly. Okay, so um, you have um, – that was obviously my next question was going to be tell me about a time when you were not in control and that was obviously a, a, a time you you recently started to segue into acro um, Max Martini's with us he's an incredible pilot when it comes to acro and um, it would be an injustice if I didn't talk about acro a little bit on this uh, show uh, where are you at and and what's next on your acro list mine yeah. Or Max's. Okay. Uh, mine, oh, I wouldn't call it acro. Uh, I think acro is a whole different flavor. I think I'm more in the freestyle right now. Um, okay. So, um, it, it's, it's, I, I do a lot of aerobatic flying, or I did in aircraft, uh, fixed wing. I flew extra 300s, uh, super decathlons. Um, that's kind of why I got into aviation is because I love being inverted. I love that feeling of you know positive G's, negative G's, and I love the world upside down. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to look at. Um, I am actually building an RV-8. Uh, it's a, it's a two-seater aerobatic airplane. It's a, it's an experimental aircraft, and one of the only reasons I'm building that particular model is it is fully capable of aerobatic flight, um, and it's certified to that as well. Um, so it's almost hard not to want to do that in a paraglider. Um, but unfortunately for me, I, I'm very, very comfortable in a fixed wing aircraft in, in a fixed wing aircraft. I, I can't say the same for paragliders. Um, I, I, I have to admit paragliders scare the living daylights out of me still. Um, I respect them tremendously. Um, they are the only aircraft 
that I know of that cannot handle zero or negative G's, they will deflate. Um, it's, so it's very hard to wrap my mind around that as a fixed wing aircraft pilot that does maneuvers. And I, you know, I've talked, I can't tumble a paraglider, nor do I think I ever will, maybe, um, but uh, I'm nowhere near that. Um, but once again, in an aircraft, I'm very, I'm, I'm very capable and I understand it. Um, I think with doing a, any kind of aerobatics, um, you got to be careful. Um, and I'm only speaking from my experience from fixed wing, not from paragliding. Um, but when I do fixed wing aerobatics, I, I go as high as I can. You know, I don't do any aerobatics lower than 5,000 feet. Uh, I'm usually over the water. I'm not like it's going to help me much, but it's going to help whoever I hit. Falling into the ocean probably won't destroy someone else's life uh, if I crash my airplane out there. But uh, once again, I, I approach all of that with a lot of caution. I do a lot of extreme sports, uh, uh, BMXing. I started that when I was a little kid. Uh, I raced uh, motocross, uh, rock climbing, um, paragliding. I mean, you did big wave surfing. I did a lot of extreme sports my whole life. And one of the common things that I learned is, is mitigating your risks. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not a great uh, paragliding pirate, pilot. I mean, there's, there's, there's a million people out here, Max right here, probably smoke me all day long. Um, and I do understand that. And, and I think a lot of people maybe jump into it too quickly. Um, they, they start flying and uh, they, they get a wing that's maybe a little too hot for them and they're trying things and that's when they end up hurt. Um, I happen to be very fortunate, and I'll, I'll knock on wood really quickly, that uh, I have sustained a lot of injuries uh, over all my different sports, um, pretty heavy ones. I've had two back surgeries because of it. But I, but I always try to limit um, how badly I get hurt. Uh, by kind of taking a step back from, from the line of no return. Um, as I said, with all the extreme sports I've ever done, a lot of my friends have gotten hurt or killed. And usually I kind of take a step back from what they were just doing. I, I watch what they did and said, okay, well, that's where the line is. If I cross that line now, uh, it's, it's not like I might get hurt. It's I probably will get hurt if something goes wrong. So freestyle thing of, of paragliding because I, I paragliding more than I do cross country. I mean, I love doing wing over spirals and basic right now. Uh, I'm not going crazy things like Max is probably doing, um, but I am doing it at baby steps. I never go bigger than I feel comfortable. Um, I make sure that I have plenty of altitude between me and the ground. Uh, I do see some people doing some ridiculous stuff really low to the ground and it's backfired and I, I don't want to be that guy. Um, so I, I think that is something that uh, I carry with me because of all the other extreme sports that I've done. That, um, that, 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 that line of caution of you just don't cross that, especially since I'm not an expert um, paraglider. I, I'm not this, this, the greatest guy in the world or I'm not on a competitive level so even more so on my level, I should be even more cautious about what I do when I'm trying to attempt even the most basic maneuvers like wing overs and spirals and, and uh, certain things like that. Um, I mean, heck, even, even doing stuff on the ground could get you hurt. So, you know, don't do it in big, big wind or big air. And just kind of, I, I try to mitigate all my risks with that as, as much as I can. Yep, that's why I sold my motorcycle. Good man, you got kids. Yeah, I got a lot <laughs> of kids. Yeah. Yeah, that and, that and paragliding for, the, for, 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 for the most part, it's like if, if you do something that kills you, it's going to be your fault. It's rarely someone else's fault. Like motorcycles, you get hit by a car and it's like, oops. Yeah, Not your I fault. Got hit. You did, Max? You did, Max? Yeah, I had an accident uh, the last week ago. The last week. And uh, yeah, it made me rethink about many things. And it's really nice to hear from you, Eddie. Uh, you're a really wise man. Um, and all of that experience you had in your life, you seem, not, you seem that you're not that old, but you have a, quite a lot of experience. And uh, it's really nice to hear from you. It's, really, it's, it's a lesson for me. Uh, I'm learning a lot from you. Uh, what wing are you flying now? Um, I was flying in an Ozone uh, Rush 4, um, and I also have an Akaro Aquila. Um, I use both of those wings depending on conditions. I got the Aquila more for high wind purposes and also for more freestyle type of flying. Um, 
once again, when I bought that wing, it was way more than I could handle. Um, I mean, I could handle it flying, but I realized when it does get into a situation, it, it does tend to accelerate a lot faster than my rush does. Um, and I'll be honest, I actually lifestyle or entry level type of things on my rush more than I do on my Aquila. All because I have more time, it's everything's slowed down. Um, and where I, at the very beginning, I was pushing, and now I'm pulling back. So um, yeah. I just sold my rush and I was, I was looking into a couple of different wings to buy for myself. Um, I was looking at some freestyle wings. I was looking at a Delta three for some cross country stuff. And I realized wings for what I want to do, uh, they're, they're too much. Uh, they're, 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 they're going to cause me to get into situations that I probably don't want to be in quite yet. Yeah. I saw on your profile and in the Google hangout, you have, uh, like, a, a Xenos or how, how you call, call that? That's a Xenos. Yeah. Xenos. Do, do you fly that way? Yes, I do. I uh, actually, I'm thinking about purchasing one, but, uh, once again, I don't know if I need all that wing quite yet. But I mean, it's like a rush because it's a certified ENB wing. I, I would think uh, it's a quite nice wing for you. Absolutely. And I, and that's why I demoed that wing. The picture that is up there is a day I demoed that wing data to where he finds. So me and Max Marion were playing around. I was land, landing on his wing. It's a great wing. But once again, when I was doing wing overs on that, I realized that I could get myself into more dynamic situations faster than I can on my rush. And once again, it's, it's a step up on my Aquila. I don't feel as comfortable doing wing overs than I do on my rush because of how fast they generate uh, energy. Um, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, and I think that's important too, because my brother and I kind of started pushing to more gliders, especially him. And we realized that we weren't really progressing as fast. Um, because I was afraid of the glider on my rush. I know what's going to happen. I know it's going to open up. It's a B glider. It's very stable. Worst case scenario. I put my hands up and I, I recover out of 90% of the things that I get myself into, uh, with the higher end gliders or, or more acro gliders. That's not the case. Um, perfect example. My brother was flying some acro gliders. Um, and he was making, you know, he was, he was progressing along and then all of a sudden he started flying a buzzy. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's all, and then I flew with him and he was, you know, doing full stalls, doing really nice sats in it, all the other fun stuff that you, you think you need an acro glider for, but you really don't. And what, what, what really worked for him, and I'm starting to realize this now, is he was more comfortable in the buzz, even though the guy's a great pilot, he, he could do a lot of things in an acro glider, but the sense of the peace of mind that if you do get into a situation, all you have to do is just put your hands up and the glider will most of the time recover. It mentally takes that block off you that something bad is going to happen if I try this. So it opens up your mind to like, I could do more stuff and not get myself into a situation I can't get myself out of. So I've kind of adapted that mentality in the last couple of months. And that's why I, I just bought another glider right now. And I bought a rush five. And the only reason I bought a Rush 5 versus something Acro, I'm going to buy the Zenus as well, but perfect, I perfect. wanted something I mean, that I could, I could be happy and comfortable in. Yeah, exactly. You're doing the right thing. You don't need an Acro glider. First of all, you will uh, sacrifice your performance. You won't climb as high as the other gliders. Uh, you will fly much faster, but uh, you have to compensate that with your safety. And uh, safety is a big issue if you want to practice. You want to have the confidence. And if you don't have uh, safety, you don't have confidence. So that's exactly my point of view. You're completely right. Well, you know, you're, 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 you're an amazing acro pilot. And I'm glad you said that because, you know, here I am. You know, I thought I was doing something wrong, but, I, you know, I, I'm glad I'm, I'm doing, <laughs> doing it the right way. But, you know, baby steps is the way I look at it. And, I have no business at, at my skill level uh, to be in a full acro glider. I, I think it would be stupid for me to do that. And I, I would probably hurt myself and, and leave this sport versus 
You know, who know, who cares if I can't do helis by next week? Um, I, you know, <laughs> I'd rather do a really nice wing over sat and learn it properly than, you know, hey, look, I did a heli, but, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing and I killed myself or I broke my leg. So I, I appreciate you saying that, Max. And it gives me a little bit more confidence to, to keep on the lower level wings. Um, one of the reasons, too, I did it is I watched Max Marion heli my rush one day. And I said, what the hell am I doing buying a better glider or a, or a more advanced glider? I can't do a heli in my rush. Until <laughs> I could do a heli in my rush, I have no business being in a different glider. So um, but I, I really appreciate that input, Max. And that's, I, 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 think, I, I think you're, I mean, I know you're absolutely right on that. It's, uh, Max, we're here to have fun. So, Max, you, um, you said you had an accident. Was that, that was with your motorcycle? Yeah, exactly. I had an accident with my motorcycle. What happened? I, Glad you're okay. Yeah. I, first of all, I was wrong. <laughs> Just to clear it up, I was wrong because, uh, well, I don't want to get much into into that. The topic is paragliding. We want and details. Then, Come on, yeah, man. Come on, man. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the detail you have to know is that I had to pay a lot to repair the car I crashed no. into. No! <laughs> oh no! That's well, at least you're live. Supposed... You're live, and you're 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 live, and you're you're okay, right? Yeah, exactly. So who cares? It's only that's money. That's a big lesson for point. me. I will I will get uh, much softer when uh, riding my motorcycle. <laughs> for now. <laughs> oh dang it! I prefer to do acro. It's much safer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's doing acro. I agree with that, Stephen. If you've seen his acro too, there's times when Max is so low, he he forgets to look up sometimes, and and then he's already there, you know, at at the beach. <laughs> it's time. It's time yeah, to land now. land now. I would say I'm not the uh, ex example for other pilots. But uh, that's what I have. I had to practice a lot uh, to get where I am. And uh, I had to fly very low um, because I didn't have any other options. But uh, just to get back to this topic, um, I'm, I did the exact, exact same thing that you did, Ed. I'm, well, first, I, I talked about this story many times but uh, just to recap I jumped on an acro glider almost killed myself and then I moved back to uh, ENA ENB wing and then I got really good because I had the confidence I had the safety and I had time to react the wing was slow it gave me time so that's the way so and I never had an accident never uh, have thrown my reserve parachute and uh, even flying low and almost crashing, I, I'm always under control. So I'm feeling very confident in, in what I am doing. And uh, yeah, but for me, I, I, well, I did many baby steps. And now I got to the point where I'm good enough to start uh, flying an acro glider, I would say. But uh, now that I had this accident, I don't have the money to buy any wing. Well, I didn't <laughs> have the money before, but for now it's much much more difficult than it was. Well, at least you're safe and you're, you're not dead. That's that's the biggest thing, right? I mean, that's that's what we want to do is not kill ourselves with this thing. I mean, the worst thing you hear is people getting hurt or dying. I did. I don't want to see anyone do that in this sport. If I can never see an accident in my life, that'd be great. Yeah, exactly. And as you said before, you you won't do it uh, over over yep. people, over houses. I, I'm always practicing low, but I'm always practicing over bushes and uh, over water. So if I crash, I crash uh, soft. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have a, about, uh, I don't know, how many guys are paramotor pilots but there's a bunch of them that uh that are with us live right now and then um numbers of them that will watch the the uh, program when it's over uh 
what do you think about PBG? Are you into it? And and I already asked you this question pre-show, but um, what are you flying as far as a wing and a motor? Um, I happen to be really good friends with JC Perrin over at Kangook USA. So uh, I, when I first met JC, I wanted to buy a pair of motor that day. Um, so I, I went out with JC. We, we did some flights together. Um, I enjoyed power paramotoring. I thought it was great. Um, but I have to say, and, and no offense to all the PPG guys here, it was it was a little bit more than I, I wanted to deal with equipment-wise. Um, the reason I got into, I don't know if that's, is that me feeding back? No, that's not you. Okay. That's probably me. Um, so, yeah. So basically, um, I tried the PPG thing. I, I, I've flown with JC, uh, Perrin over at Kangook USA. I think they're gr- it's a great sport. Don't get me wrong. I just it was a little bit too much equipment for me. The noise, uh, the vibration. Um, I fly airplanes, so if I want to have a motor, I'll, I'll go fly an airplane because I'll get there faster. Um, there is something beautiful about PPGing. You do have a lot of freedom, and you have a paraglider. It's pretty neat. Um, I think I think it needs to be. I think some of the issues need to be addressed. Like, you know, I don't like the gasoline motors. They don't run half the time. Uh, they're carbureted. There's a lot of flaws with the actual equipment. Um, I think it's very antiquated. Um, and I think that causes a lot of problems for the PPG community. Um, I'm currently working on a couple of uh, different electric um, prototypes that uh, J- both JC and I are, are, are playing with, with, uh, with a couple other people as well. Um, I can't really name too much about what we're doing, but um, because I don't know what kind of confidence with everything else. But we are we are trying to address some of the the power paramotoring um, issues. One being gasoline engines. Uh, we are actually going full electric on all our prototypes. Uh, we're trying to encompass batteries into it. Um, but with 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 electric items, there there's a whole set of uh, other issues, uh, electrical fires. So we're trying to make everything as fail safe as possible. For, for using it as a PPG. Um, I think the electric uh, versions are gonna be amazing, um, especially in the next five years, 10 years, as batteries get lighter with higher density capacity for electricity. Um, that's one of the biggest caveats we have right now or the problems is uh, batteries. They only last so long, they only store so much energy and they are heavy. Um, even with some of the Tesla stuff that we've uh, tested out with some of the Tesla batteries, there's still a, a tremendous amount of weight there um, and a tremendous amount of energy that's coming out of those things. So we need to harness that correctly and balance out the weight. Um, uh, I think it's um, if we could get away from the gasoline part of it, I think uh, it, it would be a great sport. Um, it'd still be loud, it wouldn't be as loud and as by as many vibrations. Um, there's a lot of things for those of for the people that haven't um, been on PPGs before. Um, there's a lot more sensories going on. You, you have your earmuffs. Uh, it's not only wind going by you, but now you have, you know, a vibration. Uh, you do something, uh, you do have something called P factor, which is the, the downward swinging prop tends to turn your risers a certain direction. Uh, so there's a lot more involved in it than just flying around and be able to hit the throttle and be able to climb and descend. Um, but I think if we take out some of the variables, like uh, dealing with the, with the engines and the constant breakdown and, and issues with the fuel um, and the carburetors and, and, and altitude issues, um, the sport will will excel. Um, but we've been having some issues around here with some of the power power motors causing too much noise. Um, and there's a lot of bureaucracy as well. So it's it's. It's a double-edged sword. It's a great sport. I, I, I would love to push it and see it excel. But, you know, there are people down below us, and they're starting to complain about the noise, um, the issues. And, unfortunately, some of us paraglider pilots are, are being associated with paragliding pilots. So the cops get called if they even see a wing up in the air. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of variables with PPG. Um, it's a great sport. I, I think it's, it's beautiful. It just it needs to evolve a little bit more. Um, in my mind, uh, until it's to a point that it's a lot easier to, to use for most people. Um, uh, the equipment's very bulky and heavy, and that's one thing I did not like about it. But once, up, once you're in the air, it's pretty neat to just be able to hit, hit the throttle and go fly around and go, hey, you know, I don't care if there's thermals today. It's a nice smooth day and be able to fly to the next destination. I, I think it's a beautiful thing. That is pretty cool. That, uh, that technology, in my opinion, is not very far away either. I think it's, uh, I think it's possible. And, um, yeah, that's cool that you're working on it. Uh, probably most people don't know, maybe a handful, 
Um, Eddie has been working on a project. Uh, he has a, an electric mountain bike. And so uh, he's fine tuned and had an engineer design the motor and, and uh, get all the gearing together. And you're not allowed to talk about that on this show because I know Tony will log back in and try to uh, comment and start taking the show. Yeah, you can mute him. <laughs> But uh, so I, I know that uh, this is not just some fluff that he's saying that he's working on this project. And this is just some um, I uh, between him and, and JC, by the way, I'm going to try to get him on the show. He's such a cool guy. Um, he's got some just uh, tons of wisdom when it comes to the sport. And he's uh, he's a tandem pilot and an instructor over at Torrey Pines. He's probably flying as we speak. Um, but uh, I, I want to take the last 10 minutes of the show to open up for uh, questions and comments uh, from the chat or from the moderators or Max, if you guys have uh, anything that you want to add or, or you want to ask uh, about. And um, I only had one other question about uh, your goals and um, what's, what's next in your agenda for flying. Um, my goals are my, my biggest goal. I, I have, I have a, I have a three-year-old child and, uh, 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 my wife's seven months pregnant with our second boy. So my goal is to say, to, uh, is to stay a dad, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I don't want to get hurt. Um, you know, I, as I become older, you, you become a little bit wiser to, to what risks you want to take and what's risks. My goal for paragliding is, is to stay safe, uh, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, I, yeah, it, it's, it's a great goal. Um, secondly, I, I, I really like, uh, freestyle flying. I, I love proximity flying, not so much speed wings, but I, I love just taking trips, hitting sand dunes. Uh, we have a trip, uh, that I'm planning here in the next couple of months to go down to Mexico and just, just do the Baja coastline. And, you know, we'll just pull up to any Ridge that looks cool and fly it and just be able to experience flight in a place that's remote and, and be with your buddies, high five each other, um, just have fun with it. Um, I, I do like the last, I would like to get better at it. I like to grow um, and, and, and go in that direction because it's something that I really love. I think it's because of my BMX background and, and I, I do like to do fun things in the air like tricks. I don't just like to sail around. Uh, I'm not knocking cross country. I think it's it is extremely difficult uh, classification of, of paragliding. I said I, I flew the rat. It was very demanding. Um, it was actually one of the most fun times I've ever had paragliding. But I enjoy freestyle more than anything else, and just being able to go out there and, and feel G's and do spirals and and really get set back in, in, into the equation. Uh, so that's that's my goals for the future of paragliding. And, and eventually take my kids up and and have them experience flight. Uh, my wife actually finally gave me the green light on our on our three year old and said I could take him up tandem when conditions permit. So uh, uh, that might happen here sooner than later. And he loves swing, biggest swing he'll ever be on, and he might get the bug and be our next acro star. Hope you know maybe in the next 20, 20 years or so. Nice. Uh, so how far are you? I I love it that you're a wagaman. <laughs> How far <laughs> are you with your ground helicos? Uh, I got them down finally. Um, I, I've actually gotten to the point that I can rotate my my rush uh, on a you know uh, on a decent day. So I, I could do my rush. That's a big one. So it's really hard to heli a rush uh, on the ground. I mean, I do stuff a tip into the ground. I'm not going to lie, but I just started doing them a couple of weeks ago um, with my because it's a smaller wing, it reacts a lot faster. But um, that's one thing that it, if I could emphasize uh, all the pilots out there that fly, um, flying is only a part of being a good paraglider pilot. I, I think a lot of paraglider, especially me, has been great handling, especially since I fly places like Hawaii. Uh, the first time I went to Hawaii, uh, my brother hikes me up the top of uh, uh, Kahana Bay, uh, and then we flow this place called the Knob. And you have zero room at the Knob for any mistakes. You have a cliff on all three sides of you. You're taking off sideways into the hill. If you can't kite and if you mess up, you're, you're going to end up dead. Um, so, I, you know, I think doing this, this groundwork with the ground helis and learning all that is just making me a better pilot when you're on the ground. Uh, last year when I was at the rat race, I was one of the last people off of the start. 
um, I was helping everyone launch. And I, I'm not knocking anybody, but it was it was a sad day to watch these people that are, quote, experienced pilots not be able to handle their wing on takeoff. Uh, I would say 50% of the pilots, and it wasn't because they're flying Xenos or Enzo or these crazy wings. It's because they were pulled on the ground. I mean, there was pilots with just A and B wings that once the wing got over their head, they would turn her off and run and forget to check the thing. And the thing would go right over the top of their head and slam in front of them. And there's 30 guys lined up behind them to take off. I mean, we had, you know, starting time of 45 minutes. And I think, yeah, they may be amazing thermal pilots or they may, it may they really, but on the ground, I hate to say it, they suck. They're not very good at it. So um, I think I spent a tremendous amount of time on the ground and that's why I started playing with a little bit more acro stuff, the ground helis, is it's made me a better pilot overall. I feel comfortable in high wind conditions. Um, I feel comfortable when I go to Hawaii and Hawaii's conditions are nothing like ours. Uh, it, it scared the heck out of me the first time I was there, but now I'm comfortable because I know I can depower my glider any moment. I know what to do if my if I get plucked really hard. All these little things that kind of we all take for granted once we start flying because we forget about them. Um, I think we all need to kind of take a moment and kind of reflect back on that and maybe practice kiting. It may not sound sexy. It's not. I like doing ground helis. I can't do a heli. I'm I'm not that good of a pilot yet. Uh, maybe I'll never do one, but. It's pretty fun to do them on the ground and see how the wing reacts. And, you know, you're in a position that you're, you're mostly safe. You know, I'm on the ground. So um, that's where I'm at with the ground helis, Max. And uh, any, anything you could provide to help me in that direction, I, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. I, I think the same. As you said, um, I'm doing my next video. I'm talking about uh, the risk and the consequences and if you're on the ground and uh, you have low risk, uh, low consequences, because you, you will not uh, die, maybe. And, uh, maybe, and you can have a high risk, so it's really um, favorable to practice. And uh, ground heli is just a small, a small bit of all the possibilities you can have, all the possibilities uh, of fun you can have on the ground. So I find it uh, um, inspiring that you you took your rush, you, you spun your rush around. So really nice. Congratulations. Yeah, I was watching him do it the other day, too. He was he was getting it down. It took him. It took him a while. So he he, he was he wasn't giving up, though. I was watching. It's a uh... It's a good workout too. I think flying yeah. is not that much of a workout, but you start you start doing groundwork. And, and Max, I mean, you're you're a great acro pilot. I mean, what's what are the next steps? And 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 one thing that I would I would ask because I am cautious. You know, I'm not going to go out and do something in the air that I'm not comfortable with. Um, what other things? I mean, I just started doing ground helis. Uh, what, what else would you recommend? You not just me, but everybody in spread is aspiring advanced stuff and, and get a feel for their wing uh what other ground maneuvers would you recommend besides just basic kiting and and, and but like uh, like uh heli wise and other maneuvers what what do you think is would be a good like practice session of like okay do a ground helis maybe learn these maybe learn that what do you think well um a ground heli is a really advanced maneuver but uh, what i always recommend for everybody is to practice um, uh, the pitch pendulum. You take off, break, and then you try to make like a swing motion. And uh, yeah, you run and then you take off and then you go, if you have enough wind, you can go backwards and then dive again and then run and, and repeat and repeat. So you can practice the pitch pendulum and you should practice your minimum velocity and your stall point. You simulate a takeoff and then you go breaking, breaking, breaking symmetrically until the glider stalls. And as you are one meter or three feet abo above the ground, you won't hurt yourself. So it's a uh, high risk of getting it wrong, but very low consequences. So that you have to practice a lot on the ground. 
I agree. And thanks, Max. I'm, you know, sometimes people look at me like, oh, what are you doing on the ground? I'm like, you know, just practicing for what I'm going to do later, hopefully. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's one thing that's helped me even even not going to do acro active flying in Hawaii. You know, out there, the guys, they fly 20 mile an hour winds all the time on their zeros. Uh, we don't here. Um, so it's a different world and being able to ground handle um, well enough to do that really helped me with flying different sites. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the people here travel, you're going to come across a site one day that maybe the, the situation isn't that great. The winds aren't favorable. They're either too strong uh, or too light. I've had situations that I've had to take off in places, um, complete dead wind. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to learn how to get your, your wing up in all conditions. Um, and I think the ground handling has really helped me in all in all those disciplines. So, excellent. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer. Your uh, your family's probably waiting there for you. I got a few. I, I got a few more minutes. We're good. Excellent. About five more. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I want to encourage everybody to go uh, to the website paraglidingtalk.com. Check out the upcoming shows. Also want to encourage you, if, if you've been a part of the show and you've been learning things from it, consider supporting the show financially with the Patreon. Uh, we got a bunch of guys that are supporting the show. Uh, I haven't touched any of that money. I'm thinking about making some T-shirts. Tell me what you guys think about this um, in the comments and um, or in the, um, in the chat afterwards if you're watching the show after it's over. Uh, I want to make some shirts that have the big pilot on the back and then maybe just like a little paraglidingtalk.com thing on the front. I was thinking about making some of those shirts and, and uh, putting them up. Tell me what you think about that. I saw somebody, one of the guys was wearing one the other day, and I saw it and it said pilot on the back, and I was like, huh. Or maybe we could make shirts that say pilot needs a ride and uh, have that shirt in your pack just in case. And then so if you're ever hitchhiking, you can just put that shirt on. I don't know. And, and then I had another idea to have uh, maybe some paragliding talk. Um, what are they called? Uh, gators. you seen those? It's just like a – um, I saw this one and I was thinking about that'd be cool if we could have, yeah, you got, see, everybody's got gators, man. I'm yeah, thinking like that'd be, cool. it'd be a cool, um, thing. So I'm gonna see if I can, and those are cheap. I can ship those in a, in an envelope probably. Yeah. See people would, they'd wear a I think the gators, top. man. It's a good idea. Gator. Yeah. Love them. Keep the stun off your face. Yeah. Max loves them. I know that Max, not Max Martini, but uh, Maximilian. Marion. Yep, Max Marion. You wear Ma uh, Max Martini. You wear them too. Nah, I don't have those, but no? uh, <laughs> they're stylish. <laughs> All right, we're gonna have to get you one. I'm gonna see what it's gonna take to make one, and uh, we'll throw that up on the uh, on the website maybe. Right on, guys. Well, I, unless there's any questions, did we miss any questions from the chat? I want to make sure that we cover those. And uh, anything that you have for uh, for Eddie or if you have questions for Max or Neil or myself. bunch of guys, I, I noticed in the chat that there was some guys talking about uh, getting into the sport. A guy named Peter was on there just a little bit ago talking about going to Saboba. Right on, Peter. Get it, dog. You can fly, too. I always get stoked because I know what it was like. I remember that feeling of just, I want to fly so bad. Didn't care what, how I was going to make it happen. And uh, I'm so glad that I did. And, and uh, it's, it's fun to talk to people who are just getting in. What, what happened to your, uh, your stuff, Neil? I heard you broke down. Oh yeah. I had a, I had some frame issues. What I had been doing was I was doing all my run-ups on the, uh, the aluminum carrier that I have for the back of my car. And um, of course, like an idiot, I was running on full throttle and it just tweaked the frame and weakened it in a few spots. So I had to take it to the fabrication shop to get it fixed. Really? So, it bent yeah. your frame? Yep. Yeah, it's just wow. well, mini, plane, mini plane frames, just, you know, aluminum tubing. It's pretty, that's the trade off. You know, it's super lightweight, but it's not very strong. So yeah, I was just, I was doing like full throttle run ups. It was, I didn't really have very good support built into the uh, to the carrier that I had put together. It was just kind of on these little two-inch pads, so it just wasn't 
wasn't solid enough for me to be running it up full throttle like that. I just tweaked it. I knew it was, I knew it was bending the frame, but I was like, ah, it'll be all right. And no, it wasn't all right. So I so got it some, snapped. Uh, it cracked. Yeah. Cracked oh, and broke. Dang. So it, it'll be all right though. I got a, I had some tubing replaced on it and I uh, modified my rack. So the full, the full length of the frame is supported and it won't be twisting around or anything like that. It's my own fault. Did you take it to Kyle O? No. <laughs> uh, that'd take too long, unfortunately. I'd have him do it, but. Oh, he's far from you, huh? I always yeah, think oh, yeah. East he's Coast. Like, he's yeah, like, yeah. He's, he's, uh, he'd probably be a day and a half drive to get out there. <laughs> oh, dang. Yeah, that's right. You're <laughs> yeah. way up north. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm putting it back together tonight. I don't have to go into work until a little later in the morning. So that's my project after this. I got to get that right. bad boy bad boy back together so I can go flying. Yeah. How's the weather out there, by the way? Fall's flying? hot. It oh. is hot. So you're, you're, uh, but the, well, what about the wind? Are you flying or no? No, I, no, my, my motor's all tore apart. There's a couple of guys been flying. I missed a few. I missed probably like, maybe like four days of flying. Okay. That's what I was Some getting. Other at. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. I missed a few days. I tried not paying attention to the weather so I wouldn't be all bummed. You know what I mean? Eddie, are you taking uh, us back into the zoo? <laughs> yeah, I am. Want to go take a tour of a lion? Yeah, yeah. We had a one behind me. <laughs> we had one question from uh, was it Atheon? He's asking about uh, um, reserves. Well, Eddie, what kind of reserve do you run? Uh, I got a round and I have a square in my acro harness, so I have both. All righty. Round and a square. So I, 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 I think um, I forgot the brands of them, but I have both. The reason I got the square is someone told me they open faster. So <laughs> that's my primary. My secondary is my old round. Um, as I said, it's more of a peace of mind, and it makes me feel good that I have two reserves, not just one. Which um, one do you throw first? Uh, the square. So have you ever um, thrown a reserve? Only, and I hope I never have to throw one ever, ever again. <laughs> you did once. I did once at an SIV because I have because I was made to do so. It wasn't. Uh, it, was, it was induced. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Who, uh, who whose uh, SIV did you do? I did uh, um, Max and Max Marion and, and Gabe from uh, Tory Pines. Were there. Nice. Right on, man. Where are you at right I now? Did. I made it back in. This is the entrance to the San Diego Zoo. And yeah. I'm going to go join up with my family. Yeah, man. Thank you again so much, Eddie. I can't wait to fly with you again. And uh, really appreciate you. Tell your wife, uh, thank you so much. And uh, no maybe worries. we'll dinner something good. soon. And Max, thank you so much again for all the feedback. You've, you've been uh, very precious. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad that uh, the baby step approach is, is, is something that you endorse. Yeah, right on. I, I have to thank you because you're a really wise man and I learned a lot I don't lot know today. about that. <laughs> so, All right, maybe, thank you, gentlemen. And, uh... Maybe let's stay in, in contact. Maybe if you have Facebook or something to share. Your, Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. I'll put his link in the description. I'll do that. In the and, description. And Robert, put us... Perfect. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Eddie, thanks for coming on, man. Right. Awesome show. Right, right on. Later. Thank you very much. All right. We'll have a short after show. Thank you again so much, everyone who's uh, been a part of the show. You guys are awesome. Um, once again, uh, great show, great learning from uh, uh, all angles. Next week's show is going to be excellent. Uh, we have uh, – I always forget Todd's last name, Todd Scandrit, who runs Resurgence PPG. He's going to be on the show. We're going to talk about uh, all things paramotoring and uh, his, uh, uh, I don't want, what do, you, what do you call it, a group, his organization, Resurgence PPG. Incredible. Profit charity. Yeah, he's got his 501c3, so you can donate to his charity. Super cool uh, idea, uh, helping out vets that uh, maybe got injured or can't walk or have P P uh, PTSD and uh, just need something to uh, bring some courage into their life or some uh, encouragement into their life. And uh, I just thought it was such a great idea and connecting both things. Um, so he's going to be on. That's going to be a great show. And then the following week, we're going to talk about speed flying. 
And so without uh, anything else, really appreciate you guys, everybody in the chat. Awesome, guys. Appreciate you. See you in the air. And uh, we'll see you next week, Thursday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Have a great night. Paragliding.com. <laughs>